The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth Chapter 6 After caching our peltry and goods by burying them in safe places, we received instructions from our general to rendezvous at the Suck by the 1st July following. Bidding each other adieu, for we could hardly expect we should meet again, we took up our different lines of march. Our party consisted, led by one Clements of six, among whom was the boy Baptiste, he always insisting on remaining with his brother, as he called me. Our route was up river, a country that none of us had ever seen before, where the foot of the white man had seldom, if ever, left its print. We were very successful in finding beaver as we progressed, and we obtained plenty of game for the wants of our small party. Wherever we hauled up a trap, we usually found a beaver, besides a considerable number we killed with the rifle. In moving up the river, we came to a small stream, one of the tributaries of Green River, which we named Horse Creek, in honour of a wild horse we found on its banks. The creek abounded with the objects of our search, and, in a very few days, we succeeded in taking over one hundred beavers, the skins of which were worth ten dollars per pound in St. Louis. Sixty skins, when dried, formed a pack of one hundred pounds. After f having finished our work on Horse Creek, we returned on the main river and proceeded on, meeting with very good success until we encountered another branch, which we subsequently named Labrach Creek, from our comrade who was murdered by the Indians. Our success was much greater here than at any other point since leaving the suck, and we followed it up until we came to a deep canyon in which we encamped. The next day, while the men were variously engaged about the camp, happening to be in a more elevated position than the others, I saw a party of Indians approaching within a few yards, evidently unaware of our being in their neighbourhood. I immediately shouted, Indians, Indians, to your guns, men, and levelled my rifle at the foremost of them. They held up their hands, saying, Bueno, bueno, meaning that they were good or friendly, at which my companions cried out to me, Don't fire, don't fire, they are friendly, they speak Spanish. We were sorry afterwards, we did not all shoot. Our horses had taken a fright at the confusion and ran up the canyon. Baptiste and myself went in pursuit of them. When we came back with them, we found sixteen Indians sitting around our camp smoking and jabbering their own tongue, which none of us understood. They passed the night and next day with us in apparent friendship, thinking this conduct assumed from the fact that they rather overdid the thing. We deemed it prudent to retrace our steps to the open prairie where, if they did intend to commence an attack upon us, we should have a fairer chance of defending ourselves. Accordingly, we packed up and left, all the Indians following us. The next day they continued to linger about the camp. We had but slight suspicion of their motives, although for security we kept constant guard upon them. From this they proceeded to certain liberties, which I hear strictly caution all emigrants and mountaineers against ever permitting, such as handing our guns, except the arms of the guard, piling them, and then carrying them together. At length, one of the Indians shouldered all the guns and started off with them, ran fifty yards from the camp. Mentioning to my mates I did not like the manoeuvres of these fellows, I started after the Indian and took my gun from him. Baptiste doing the same, and we brought them back to camp. Our companions chided us for doing so, saying we should anger the Indians by doubting their friendship. I said I considered my gun as safe in my own hands as in the hands of a strange savage. If they chose to give up theirs, they were at the liberty to do so. When night came on, we all lay down except for Labrash, who kept guard having an Indian with him to replenish the fire. Some of the men had fallen asleep, lying nearby, 
when we were all suddenly startled by a loud cry from Labrash and the instant report of a gun, the contents of which passed between Baptiste and myself, who both occupied one bed, the powder burning a hole in our upper blankets. We were all up in an instant. An Indian had seized my rifle, but I instantly wrenched it from him, though I acknowledge I was too terrified to shoot. When we had in some measure recovered from our sudden fright, I hastened to Labrash and discovered that a tomahawk had been sunk in his head, and there remained. I pulled it out, and in examining the ghastly wound, buried all four fingers in my right hand in his brain. We bound up his head, but he was a corpse in a few moments. Not an Indian was then to be seen, but we well knew that they were in the bushes close by, and that in all possibility we should every one share this, the fate of our murdered comrade. What to do now was the universal inquiry. With the butt of my rifle I scattered the fire to prevent the Indians making a sure mark of us. We then proceeded to pack up with the utmost dispatch, intending to move into the open prairie, where, if they attacked us again, we could at least defend ourselves, notwithstanding our disparity of numbers, we being five to sixteen. On searching for Labrash's gun, it was nowhere to be found, the Indian who had killed him having doubtless carried it off. While hastily packing our articles, I very luckily found five quivers, well stocked with arrows, the bows attached, together with two Indian guns. These well supplied our missing rifle, for I had practised so much with the bow and arrow that I was considered a good shot. When in readiness to leave, our leader inquired in which direction the river lay. His agitation had been so great that his memory had failed him. I directed the way and desired every man to put the animals upon their utmost speed until we were safely out of the willows, which order was complied with. While thus running the gauntlet, the balls and arrows whizzed around us as fast as our hidden enemies could send them. Not a man was scratched, however, though two of our horses were wounded, my horse having received an arrow in the neck and another being wounded near the hip, both slightly. Pursuing our course, we arrived soon on the open ground, where we considered ourselves comparatively safe. Arriving at a small rise in the prairie, I suggested to our leader that this would be a good place to make a stand, for if the Indians followed us, we had the advantage in position. No, he said, we will proceed on to New Mexico. I was astonished at this answer, well knowing, though slightly skilled in geography, that New Mexico must be many hundred miles farther south. However, I was not captain, and we proceeded. Keeping the return track, we found ourselves, in the afternoon of the following day, about sixty miles from the scene of the murder. The assault had been made, as after we learned, by three young Indians, who were ambitious to distinguish themselves in the minds of their tribe by the massacre of an American party. We were still descending the banks of the Green River, which is the main branch of the Colorado, when, about the time mentioned above, I discovered horses in the skirt of the woods on the opposite side. My companions pronounced them buffalo, but I was confident they were horses, because I could distinguish white ones among them. Proceeding still farther, I discovered men with the horses, my comrades still confident I was in error. Speedily, however, they all became satisfied of my correctness, and we formed the conclusion that we had come across a party of Indians. We saw by their manoeuvres that they had discovered us, for they were then collecting all their property together. We held a short council, which resulted in a determination to retreat toward the mountains. I, for one, was tired of retreating and refused to go farther, Baptiste joining me in my resolve. We took up a strong position for defence, being a place of difficult approach, and having our guns and ammunition and abundance of arrows for defence, considering our numbers, we felt ourselves rather a strong garrison. The other three left as to our determination to fall together, 
and took to the prairie. But, changing mind, they returned and rejoined us in our position, deeming our means of defence better in one body than when divided. We all, therefore, determined to sell our lives as dearly as possible should the enemy attack us, feeling sure that we could kill five times our number before we were overpowered, and that we should, in all probability, beat them off. By this time, the supposed enemy had advanced towards us, and one of them hailed us in English as follows, Who are you? We are trappers. What company do you belong to? General Ashley's. Hurrah, 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 they all shouted, and we in return exhausted our breath in replying. Is that you, Jim Buckworth? said a voice from the party. Yes, is that you, Castenga? I replied. He answered in the affirmative, and there were those another round of hurrahs. We inquired where their camp was. They informed us it was two miles below at the ford. Baptiste and myself mounted our horse, descended the bank, plunged into the river, and were soon exchanging salutations with another of the general's old detachments. They also had taken us for Indians, and had gathered their horses while we took up our position for defence. The night was spent in general rejoicing in relating our adventures and recounting our various successes and reverses. There is as much heartfelt joy experienced in falling with another party of fellow trappers in the mountains as is felt at the sea when, after a long voyage, a friendly vessel just from port is spoken and boarded. In both cases, a thousand questions are asked. All have wives, sweethearts or friends to inquire after, and then the general news from the States is taken up and discussed. The party we had fallen in with consisted of 16 men. They had been two years out, had left Fort Yellowstone only a short time previously, and were provided with every necessary for a long excursion. They had not seen the general, and did not know he was in the mountains. They had not seen the general, and did not know he was in the mountains. They had lost some of their men who had formed victim to the Indians, but in trapping had been generally successful. Our little party also had done extremely well, and we felt great satisfaction in displaying to them seven or eight packets of sixty skins each. We related to them the murder of Labrache, and every trapper boiled with indignation at the recital. All wanted instantly to start in pursuit, and revenge upon the Indians the perpetration of their treachery. But there was no probability of overtaking them, and they suffered their anger to cool down. The second day after our meeting, I proposed that the most experienced mountaineers of their party should return with Baptiste and myself to perform the burial rites of our friend. I proposed three men with ourselves, as sufficient for the sixteen Indians in case we should fall in with them and they would certainly be enough for the errand if we met no one. My former comrades were too tired to return. We started and arrived at our, un at our unfortunate camp, but the body of our late friend was not to be found, though we discovered some of his long black hair clotted with blood. On raising the traps we had set before our precipitate departure, we found a beaver, in every one except four, which contained each a leg, the beavers having amputated them with their teeth. We then returned to our companions and moved on to Willow Creek, where we were handy to the caches of our rendezvous at the Suck. It was now about June 1st, 1822. Here we spent our time very pleasantly, occupying ourselves with hunting, fishing, target shooting, foot tracing, gymnastic, and sundry other exercises. Our detachments now came in, bringing with them quantities of peltry, all having met with very great success.